The UN has mainly focused on issues related to enforced disappearances and violence against women. Prior to joining the United Nations, Ms. Guzman worked in academia, civil society, and the public sector in Mexico City. We also have on this panel Dr. Rahim Awan. Dr. Awan is the Director General of Legal Aid, Society, Legal Aid and Justice Authority. He holds a PhD in law and completed his LLM from the University of Bedfordshire, UK. He has four years of teaching experience as visiting lecturer of research and thesis writing to LLM students and law in action to LLB students in the U University of Bedfordshire, United Kingdom. Our moderator for this panel is Ms. Zoha Shahid. Ms. Zoha is a senior research associate at Research Society for International Law Islamabad. Her area of focus is human rights. She is currently leading a project on business and human rights focusing on the perfection of human rights in business activities. Um, is my mic working? Assalamu alaikum everyone and um, I'm thankful to all the panelists for joining us today and of course I would like to extend my thanks to the Honorable Mr. Justice Jawad Hassan uh, for the very comprehensive assessment that he did of economic, cultural and social rights, especially in the context of Pakistan. Um, today we'll be talking about a wide variety of rights because of course when we talk about economic, cultural and social rights, we're, we can't narrow it down, we can't talk about one particular thematic area. This is an umbrella term which obviously encapsulates various rights that are integral to human existence. Um, but I am personally a proponent of contextualization. I am a proponent of looking at the unique challenges that Pakistan faces that exist within the context that we live in. Um, and of course, tailoring the international standards to fit into our realities, which is why my first question is going to be uh, for Mr. Suru Pajaz, because I would like to talk about what we are facing when it comes to economic, cultural and uh, social rights and the unique challenges that Pakistan faces. So if you could shed some light on uh, the context that we live in, on the very important areas uh, that require work in Pakistan, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I think I'll Beginning, firstly, uh, I think His Lordship Justice Jawad Hassan has, has spoken very comprehensively uh, and very eloquently on what is going right. Uh, so my task perhaps is to talk about you know, what uh, other branches or the other parts of the government can do. In terms of the challenges which are unique to Pakistan, I think we'll start by saying that mo there is the challenges which are more amplified for countries like pa uh, Pakistan and countries like Pakistan which starts off with the idea, without going into too much history, of how civil and political rights and economic and social and cultural rights after the post of uh, the, the Second World War, how this international regime came. And the idea was the civil and political rights which are immediately enforceable. Uh, and their economic, social and cultural rights which are to be progressively realized. Uh, and the logic for that, the underlying rationale for that was uh, to grant somebody freedom of expression, a state cannot go and take the position <coughs> of a resource allocation yeah. as opposed to granting the right to clean water or the right to education, etc, etc. Uh, and so there were rights where you had no defense, so you had to give freedom of expression, you had to give freedom of religion as opposed to housing, shelter, etc. Our constitution uh, was a very progressive document when it was formulated, as uh, Justice Javad Hassan has, has talked about. Uh, but like the time that it was drafted, like uh, of that idea of fundamental rights and what are now also principles of policy, uh, which again are aspirational goals for the state, which the state has the ambition of, the intention of, uh, of fulfilling at some point. Uh, and we've come very far from that, and we've come, made great progress. Uh, some of that has already been talked about, uh, and talked about uh, very eloquently. Uh, for example, things like 25A, where, so the question then was the justiciability or the, uh, of economic, social, and cultural rights. Mm -hmm. Because for two reasons, uh, for reason one, I said a problem which is often framed as a resource problem which we can talk about if we get the time, in, uh, which could be a resource allocation thing. I can give you examples. 
Pakistan spends 2.8% of its GDP on education. UNESCO guidelines say you know, spend 4 to 6%. So while you can't be asked to produce money that you don't have, of course, what you can be asked is while you have the second largest out of school population in the world, you spend the money that you have. So that's one problem that you know, uh, maybe uh, uh, we can talk about. Uh, and the second problem was to view this as policy, right? There are legal principles and there are policy. And what the problem with justiciability is, you know, uh, how do you design, enforce, implement policies? Uh, in Pakistan, some of the challenges when you talk about economic and social and cultural rights, again, by no means unique to Pakistan, is that this, these are not two separate baskets of rights. These are not civil and political rights uh, and economic and social rights. I mean, the, the incredible work the Justice Project Pakistan does, and I think Sarah Bilal rightly reminds everybody that there are no rich people on death row, for example. Yeah. And that tells you about when you... It, it's a dialectical relationship or a vicious cycle, however you want to look at it. If you're disenfranchised, civil in, uh, or robbed of, or deprived or denied your civil and political rights. The chances of you being denied your economic and social and cultural rights become higher. Uh, I, we have somebody from the UN, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, Philip Aus uh, Alston has just done a report, uh, I mean, not just, but recently, did a report on extreme poverty in the US, for example, and the idea of criminalization of poverty. So that's one bit of it. Uh, we can, when you talk about labor rights, we can illustrate it with another exa other example, which is freedom of association is talked about, trade unions. Uh, Pakistan has abysmal trade union percentages. Some people at the most charitable say 3%. It could be even less uh, if we exclude public sectors. But that is a direct worker safety. Uh, in Bangladesh, the worst possible, the worst uh, industrial action in recent history, maybe 2012, Rana Plaza, yeah. collapsed. And after a lot of work, what I mean, Human Rights Watch looked at uh, garment workers in Pakistan, is that if those workers were unionized and they see a structure which is going to collapse, they won't go in. They will actually, so that would be a life saving thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, so firstly, these, if so, if you unionize, you have the right to association, you have the freedom of expression, you will have, it says, a direct link with your living standards, with, uh, with your ability to ask for, bargain, uh, get, in the ultimate analysis, economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, so, I mean, and those, again, I'm sort of trying to uh, sort of just highlight issues rather. In, for you, uh, coming to the question of what is unique to Pakistan. Uh, something which is unique to our context, one obvious bit is uh, the, it's often said it's a post-colonial legal system, but it's exacerbated uh, in a situation like this. Uh, if you have a Factories Act of 1934, which is for Pakistan, pre-industrialization. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm not, you know, there's a 20th, 19th century industrialization around the world, but it, the, the scale of industry, the scale of what a factory was, this, the idea of how a factory worked, the idea of how, how many people a factory employed, was very different in 1934. The law still has rupees 500 fines for factory owners. So there is the need to do that. There is the need to update laws. The second problem, of course, is an again an intuitive one, which is uh, enforcement, enforcement of the laws that we have. Uh, I can again give you an example, this would be from 2019, which is, it's a capacity issue. The capacity issue is that in Karachi in 2019, I, I'm, I'm open to being corrected here, uh, there were 537 labor inspectors, without going into the qualifications of or the recruitment processes, etc., etc. Two of them were women. Two out of 537 were women. And these labor inspectors were going to talk about, uh, about hygiene conditions, about uh, so that, that's one problem. The second is what we've seen is, and that's a larger comment, and it's, it's again not unique to Pakistan, but unique to countries such as Pakistan. It is what we've seen post the 90s, which is a deregulation and privatization. And what is deregulation meant in our context? Uh, I think one example of that was, and that's directly related to the first thing I said, people who are deprived of economic and social and cultural rights 
are not in rooms like this. They are not, they, you know, as Jaisab has said, they can if proactively be being brought to court and the courts or the justice walking to them, but they're not in rooms like this. And that is a problem. The problem is, uh, so uh, what, uh, one example I can give, again, uh, maybe 2006, 7, one provincial government, uh, but that's true for other provincial governments uh, in the provinces happened. Uh, as a mayor, so as a stated mayor, to attract investment, to provide an environment conducive to investment and trade, and so on and so forth, ban labor inspections. Mm -hmm. And that gives you, there is the macro and there is the micro. Uh, they are now, uh, again, because you know, we live in a political minefield era, but there, there, there are, there are gov provincial governments in this country right now, which have said that you can only do a labor inspection when you tell the factory owner in advance. But, you know, some inspection that would be, right? So there is a problem, which is a larger problem of, so there's the problem of looking at these laws, uh, these rights as rights, as entitlements. That's the conversation on social protection right now. It is not generosity. This is not a handout. This is not the state being benevolent. This is not the state being kind. Uh, the fundamental premise is that the state is the duty bearer and the individual is the right holder, uh, as in civil and political rights. And that is, the, the conversation now has, has moved uh, to universal income, uh, to base universal social protection, to universal safety nets. Uh, and the second is that there is a larger elite capture problem of this country and of countries such as uh, ours, which, which is a problem which is, again, one would one not want to do the segue completely uh, to that, but I can give you another example of how civil and political rights and economic and social and cultural rights interact, is in the city that we are, uh, when informal settlements are to be raised, mm. demolished, people are to be thrown out of their houses, possibly displaced, involuntary displacement, a whole host of terms to call that. They're also charged with terrorism offenses, 780A, for protesting, for organizing. So there is, there is a convergence of both denial of these rights and the capacity in, uh, to uh, advocate and get that, uh, to get them. So there are, again, as I said, there are problems unique to us. There are, there are perhaps, there are, but there is a larger problem of the world coming to the idea, and that is rooted in the post-World War II, where civil and political rights came from the European values of enlightenment uh, and completely indispensable as, as they are, uh, and economic, social, and cultural rights was where you would say that, you know, that those were socialist ideas. Yeah. And so I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there you've, of course, highlighted very important points. Um, we've, been able to identify that there's not just <coughs> issues in terms of lack of recognition of rights, but there's a huge lack of enforcement, there's a need to update laws, there exists a need for the state to identify that these are rights, that these right holders exist, um, sort of um, can hold the state accountable for as well, and these aren't uh, being given to them out of kindness. Um, in that context and with that background that exists in Pakistan, I would like to come to Gabriela because, um, of course, as Justice Jawad also mentioned is in opening remarks, international law plays a very important role when it comes to the protection of human rights in this country as well. So I would like to understand from you what the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights means, what are the standards that exist under it, and, and how do countries implement it? Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you. Yes, of course. I mean, the, the first thing I would like to highlight is that the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights is um, the main protection, uh, the main UN instrument uh, protecting uh, these rights, but it's not the only one. These rights are also covered in other important uh, UN treaties, uh, such as the uh, Convention on Discrimination Against Women, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on Disabilities. All these conventions include uh, provisions on health, education, and uh, these types of rights. These are conventions that have been signed and ratified by Pakistan. Um, so there are other sources 
uh, international sources of, 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 of um, obligations, of state obligations on, on these types of rights. Also at the regional level, there are uh, regional mechanisms, the European Charter, the American Convention. Uh, in the Inter-American system, for example, there's a specific uh, protocol on economic, social, and cultural rights, um, the Protocol of San Salvador. In the African system, there's not only the African Charter, but there's a specific charter on the rights and welfare of the child, which also includes provisions on economic, social, and cultural rights. Um, so, uh, as I said, Pakistan is a state party to many of the universal conventions, and those obligations emanate from there as well, not only the, the, the covenant. Now, again, in theory, uh, these sets of rights are classified as economic, social, and cultural. This in theory, but um, in practice, really, the boundaries and the characteristics of these rights are quite... Uh, are not so easily classifiable. Mm -hmm. For example, again, in the, and I refer to the Latin American context because that's where I come from, um, the, there's a, a practice of speaking of economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights as a separate category. And there's a big push from grassroots movements and indigenous peoples to advocate for uh, environmental rights separately, and including through strategic through the courts, uh, litigation, sorry. So both in national courts within the Latin American countries, but also in the international and the inter-American system. Mm, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, I won't go into detail to which, uh, which rights we identify as economic, social, and cultural. I mean, broadly speaking, when we speak of economic rights, we usually refer to everything that has to do with uh, the right to work, the fair wages, uh, social security. When we speak about social rights, it usually has to do with everything that uh, has to do with uh, adequate standard of living, education, health, uh, water and sanitation. Most recently, has been, been pushed quite a bit by the international mechanisms. And then when we speak of cultural rights, we speak about the right to participate in cultural life, uh, to benefit from the progress in you know, um, uh, uh, scientific advancement. So those are the three categories. But as I said, these rights tend to are interrelated and tend to, tend to merge quite a bit. Um, now, in terms of the state obligation that comes from the international, uh, international treaties, uh, the, the, but, but, but at least what the international covenant requires is for states to first take steps to the maximum of their available resources. And the idea is to achieve progressively the full realization of economic, social, and cultural rights. Now, as Arup mentioned earlier, sometimes there's a misinterpretation of what we mean by the progressive realization of, uh, of, uh, of these rights. This does not mean at all that if the state doesn't have any resources, then it doesn't have a responsibility to protect these rights. There are actually in the treaties uh, provisions for, that are of immediate action, and that is that the state needs to start taking these steps immediately. And most importantly, it has to do without discrimination, uh, making, uh, being careful to uh, enable both men and women to have access to these rights, paying special attention at uh, uh, population certain situation of vulnerability or risk. So these provisions are of immediate application. However, the progressive realization is more in the sense that the, 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 the responsibility to, to continue improving const constantly and progressively <coughs> until everybody in the country falls, uh, enjoys fully of, of these rights. Um, the state obligations under, for, I mean, not only for economic, social, and cultural rights, the state's obligations in human rights, uh, broadly speaking, uh, in the, uh, emanating from international human rights law, can be put under three headings. Uh, one is the right to respect human rights, yeah. one is the right to, sorry, the obligation, the obligation to respect human rights, the obligation to protect human rights, and the obligation to fulfill human rights. So if we take, for example, the right to work as an example, uh, right, uh, the obligation to respect. So the state must not use forced labor. It must not deny political opponents work opportunities. That would be the respect of the human right. To protect human rights, the state must ensure that, employer, uh, that employ, employers, both in public and private sector, pay minimum wages and have good working conditions for their employees. Fulfill human rights. The state must promote the enjoyment of these rights by, for example, uh, 
launching and uh, supporting educational and labor fairs so people can find employment. So for each of these rights, whether we're speaking about health, education, uh, housing, the state has this threefold obligation. Now, uh, the, com the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which is the treaty body that oversees the implementation of the covenant for those states that, like Pakistan, have ratified and signed and ratified, has also developed what, is called, what are called general comments. Uh, and these are authoritative um, um, descriptions or analysis of what each of these rights entails. So that is one very useful guide to really understand what we mean by each of these rights. And it's not only the, the treaty bodies or this specific treaty body that's developed these general comments, also other international uh, mechanisms of the UN, such as the special procedures. You know, there's a special rapporteurs on many economic, social, and cultural rights. We have special rapporteurs on education, on health, on water and sanitation, on housing. They have developed through thematic guidance, thematic uh, studies, uh, quite thorough analysis of each of these rights, what they mean and how the state can implement them, providing very specific recommendations as to how to uh, achieve them. But not only the rapporteurs that work on economic, social and cultural rights, also the, rap the, the special procedures that work on issues related to civil and political rights, on torture, enforced disappearances or arbitrary detention, have also um, published uh, reports that show the linkages between these rights and, and the particular violations that they cover. I bring to, as an example, because that's my area of work, the work of the Working Group on Enforced Disappearances. It has a very specific thematic report on the linkages between enforced disappearances and economic, economic social, and cultural rights. And there you can see, for example, the, the effects that an enforced disappearance has on the families of the disappeared person, and the, and the women, the children that stay alone, they lose the breadwinner. What kind of affectations to their economic, social, and cultural rights do these families suffer as a result of a violation of a civil and political uh, of a, of a, of a political civil right? Mm -hmm. And then also in, in the other sense, how, for example, human rights defenders that work on the defense of eco uh, economic, social, and cultural rights, particularly the defense of land, are more often targets of civil uh, violations of their civil and political rights, mm -hmm. such as arbitrary detention for disappearance. So there is a wealth of uh, expertise emanating from the UN mechanisms that can also guide and help states to better implement their mm -hmm. obligations under inter international covenant, but not only under that covenant, but under the many other treaties to which Pakistan is a party in this right. particular case. Thank you so much, Gabriela, and thank you for highlighting, of course, the importance of the UN mechanisms and how, how states can leverage that. But one point that from, uh, from your uh, explanation of economic, social and cultural rights, I would like to really highlight is the, the responsibility to protect and fulfilling human rights that exists internationally. And that, of course, includes access to remedy as well. And, and our judiciary has uh, shown that they are active in terms of protecting economic, social, and cultural rights as well. And that brings me to my next question. Um, Dr. Reen Saab, I would like to ask you, when we're talking about access to remedy, and we're talking about the role of the judiciary, within the Pakistani context, how can the judiciary and how has the judiciary been able to protect uh, economic, social, and cultural rights? Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, since a very elaborate uh, presentation of uh, His Lordship Justice Shivat Saab, and he mentions different articles of the Constitution of Pakistan under which the judiciary of Pakistan is ensuring the protection of fundamental rights of the Pakistani citizen, I would uh, just refer Article 37 and 38 of the Constitution of Pakistan, which guarantees the social well-being and eradication of the social evils. Which clearly reflects, and in Pakistan, in, not in Pakistan, in every country of the world, constitution stays at the top of the pyramid of the old legislation. So when the constitution of Pakistan guarantees, especially the Article 37 and 38, uh, this clearly reflects the wisdom uh, of the parliamentarians and the parliament uh, to protect the social well-being of the citizens of Pakistan. With regard to the judiciary of Pakistan, his lordship referred uh, when someone uh, doesn't perform his duties, uh, judiciary steps in. Uh, I would recall one proceedings of the standing committee when I've been called there 
and uh, one of the senior most parliamentarians and very aggressive in the parliamentarian, he said, how judiciary uh, is uh, stepping into the work of the executive? I responded, I said, sir, uh, if you leave the vacuum, someone needs to fill that vacuum. And no one is better than the judiciary to fill that vacuum. Because Lord Denning says, someone has to be trusted, let it be judges. So if you perform your duty, there's no vacuum, no one will step in. So by exercising uh, Article 199 of the Constitution of Pakistan by the High Courts and Article 1843 of the Constitution of Pakistan by the Supreme Court of Pakistan, Supreme Court is always in the uh, judiciary of Pakistan is always in the to protect the fundamental rights, especially the social well-being of the citizen of Pakistan. His Lordship referred the Shala Ziyaz case. Uh, in that case, the uh, right to life has been explained uh, uh, to the uh, to the uh, very length where it been said li right to life doesn't mean only right right of living it covers all uh, facilities of the life necessary uh, for a citizen of pakistan to live in the country which includes right of education right of prayer, right of uh, uh, air, right of uh, good environment, right of education, everything is covered. I would also refer the uh, Supreme Court of Pakistan uh, uh, under uh, Article 25A of the Constitution of Pakistan ensured uh, that the education policy and educa education is available for the all citizens of Pakistan. The problem lies, in my understanding, with the implementation of the uh, not only the statutory commands and the constitutional uh, command, but also the directions of the honorable courts. Because once judgment is there, then normally courts uh, don't intervene unless someone comes back to the court saying that these uh, judgments or orders are not implemented. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of things, like say, for the occupational health and safety, there was direction of the Supreme Court of Pakistan and I being uh, Secretary of the Law and Justice Commission of Pakistan, as then I was, we ensured uh, that that was the under occupational health and safety, we had, but we ensured all kind of uh, protection and safety to the labor of the country, industrial workers, their health, their safety, their well-being, everything. So these all things are done at the part of the Supreme Court of Pakistan and the High Courts. Uh, at this point, I want to share uh, one thing which is very important. Every day we hear in the news and the talk shows and uh, 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 so social media that the judiciary of Pakistan uh, stays at, I guess, 138 uh, in the World Index. I would invite everybody to see uh, w what actually uh, World Justice Index provides. That is the rule of law index not the index for the justice sector, not the index of the judiciary. And rule of law uh, cannot be equated with the working of the judiciary and the working of the courts in Pakistan. Rule of law in, involves all the justice sector uh, stakeholders, including police, including prosecution, uh, parliament, parliament, executive, whoever is responsible uh, for the rule of law in the country, not only the judiciary. And if you see, I'm surprised the, on the researchers of the World Justice Index and also uh, the uh, expert, legal experts of Pakistan who are always behind the judiciary uh, on the basis of uh, that report. If you see, even for the rule of law, if you see the principles of the dices, mm -hmm. uh, those principles are missing in the, the, that rule of law report. Mm -hmm. They uh, they set 64 variables, eight main variables, and then uh, eight vari further variables for each e under each head. So all 64, only three are directly related to the uh, to the courts of Pakistan. Rest of the 61 are related uh, to the other justice sector stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So in my believing, judiciary, if you don't find the judiciary working, I guarantee you, no one can guarantee protection of fundamental rights in Pakistan. This is the only judiciary because of which you are sitting here 
I am sitting here and the rest of the people are talking with the liberty. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Rahim. Um, of course, the, the, the judiciary has done a commendable job. We've seen countless cases where rights are being protected because of judicial activism and because Thank they've you. been able to leverage that position even when public interest litigation has occurred. Um, but we don't live in an ideal situation. We live in a situation where countless issues of economic, social and cultural rights continue to exist in Pakistan and they remain personal. Assistant. We're dealing with child labor, we're dealing with bonded labor, we're dealing with issues of occupational health and safety, we're dealing with the right to health, the right to working, adequate standard of living, etc. And I can obviously probably just keep talking about the list of rights that uh, and the list of things that uh, continue to go wrong here. But Saroop, my question from you is where do we go from here? What are, what are our possible solutions as a state? What are steps and strategies that we need in place right now so we can ensure that these violations um, end somewhere? Um, I mean, it's, it's of course a very broad um, and a large question and I uh, proclaim no expertise to solve Pakistan's uh, socio-economic and cultural problem. Uh, well, I, I think I agree uh, that the judiciary has filled the vacuum, uh, has had a proactive role, uh, as you say, a commendable role. But there is so much that the judiciary can do, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Because these problems are, are essentially political problems. They're societal problems, they're political problems. Uh, and there are multiple ways of looking at this, when you mm. look at economic, social and cultural rights, of course this is a huge basket of rights when yeah. one is talking about, and some of them really sort of dramatically different from each other and would require a response which would be suitable and hence dramatically different. One obvious way is of course uh, when you look at things like economic justice uh, uh, or uh, right to water, sanitation, uh, food, shelter, that is these for that, you have to build political institutions that deliver on that. Those what can be local government institutions, those have to be municipal institutions. Because there is the macro level of the lawmaking. Mm -hmm. There's the level of, of the high courts and the supreme courts, and there's the level of the principle and the policy. Uh, but you need to have a requisite. And while the judiciary is doing a great job, and it has done really well, Pakistan judiciary on this, on economic, social, and cultural rights when compared to the region, uh, stands out as a, as a shining example. But that's not, uh, not sufficient because everyone else needs to, as Dr. Sa was saying, needs to do their job. In terms of where do we go from here, one example that we see, laws do matter. Mm -hmm. uh, Article 25A does matter mm -hmm. because this is not an aspiration of the state anymore. The state has now promised uh, that every child from the age, between the ages of 5 and 16, shall have uh, free and compulsory education. Yeah. Somebody would go to court and ask for it. Uh, the second bit is to make it part of the political agenda. The part, because part of what is happening uh, is that uh, this economic, social and cultural rights basket is no longer part of the political agenda. Uh, and one can look at that. And there, there are matrices of looking at that. You can look at political manifestos. Uh, and look at the social economic promises, not how somebody has kept a promise or not. Mm -hmm. Has somebody bothered making one? Yeah. And you'll see a pattern uh, from 1970 onwards, uh, mm -hmm. depending on, on, of course, actors and stakeholders, etc. Uh, that's one. The, I've, I've talked about capacity, I've talked about uh, colonial laws. There, there needs to be now, there are challenges that did not exist. Mm -hmm. There are things that did not exist. Uh, this is the entire conversation where we are talking about the digital regulation, right? Mm -hmm. At the international level. Uh, and then now there are actors and corporate actors. So while I'll give you an example of how the world has changed and for a lot of these basket of rights, uh, that engagement has to happen. Uh, there is, so I'm, I'll, I'll channel my example. I'm working on Sri Lanka and the IMF for Human Rights Watch uh, in, in one role. Uh, so for the first time, very rarely, we've done it in Latin America, I, I'm not with, with international financial institutions, is Human Rights Watch is making demands of the I, IMF, for example, mm -hmm. saying that you can't have a subsidy removal, etc. But apart from that, Sri Lanka's, uh, most people know uh, in Pakistan, the Sri Lanka's economic crisis. So one of large, Sri Lanka's largest creditors 
I mean, there is IMF, there are other sort of bilateral. Is, is an investment firm called BlackRock. Mm -hmm. Sri Lanka owes it billions of dollars, and the country is going under. Uh, that is the kind of power that now so, did not have to. Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International would not go to BlackRock. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a few months ago, I went to the Twitter headquarter. And I now every year when I go to the US, I have to go to Facebook. Mm -hmm. Because for the first time in the history of, since the Gothenburg Press, the power to censor speech does not lie with the state. The most powerful regulator, and this is the first time in history, where the state will grant you free expression. I mean, I'm just, I mean, about the new actors, right? The state takes away free expression. Well, the most powerful regulator of free speech is, is Facebook or, or Twitter, etc. Mm -hmm. So what, I mean, which is true for other countries as well, is how what I said, the Factories Act 1934 won't cut it. Yeah. Because, uh, firstly, because it will have a 500 rupee fine for a violation, mm -hmm. which would just be ludicrous. But secondly, it is because it was formed, the problem that it seeks to, the problem that we need to solve now did not exist at that time. So there is that. There is, of course, because I'm not going, the judiciary has fulfilled the role. We have great expectations from the judiciary. The judiciary is doing very well on this. Who is failing on this is both the executive and the legislature. Uh, you, one can go on for this and, and drone on and ramble on for, forever. Uh, but as I said, you know, for a lot of this, you will have to do so poverty eradication. So, mm -hmm. I mean, now there's a discussion of protection from extreme poverty as a fundamental right. Yeah. And that's why I gave the UN Special Rapporteur's example of, sort of uh, you know, in uh, California, in, in Alabama, in other parts of the US. And, but that, no federal government can do it. Mm -hmm. No provincial government for, let's say, Punjab, for the uh, population the size of France. Uh, will do it. Mm -hmm. that, those are municipal functions. Uh, so when you talk about health, sanitation, sewerage, even environment, so there's the policy making level, there is now the, uh, the level of dialogue, the level of stakeholders, the level of implementation. So you have to modernize, you have to divert resources, you have to make it part of the political agenda, and you have to, what, you know what Jaisab said, was about justice going to people. Uh, and the, the, the courts are doing it, but one way of taking justice to people is at the level that the most people can be reached and can reach. So, I mean, and as I said, it's, it's too broad a question yeah. and I... I do have really a brief follow-up. Um, so, you've talked about how these challenges exist and how um, it's not very easy because, of course, a lot of it has to come from first maneuvering around governance structures. But one excuse that you see a lot, especially from governmental departments, is the resources deficit that they're facing. So, very briefly, how, how do we manage that? Okay, I, I give you an example. There are two prob uh, There is a resource availability problem, mm. and there is a ro resource allocation problem. I give you the uh, example of education. Pakistan, uh, last I checked, uh, 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 spends 2.8 percent of its GDP uh, on education, with 22.5 million uh, uh, children out of school. UNESCO says 4 to 6 percent. Pakistan can't produce the money that it ha doesn't have, of mm. course. But it can from the existing kitty. Mm. And I think that was what Gabriela was saying as well on progressive realization. Pakistan spends about 0.45% on, sort of, uh, part of it was on health. Uh, and you look at resource allocation. Mm. So there is resource availability when a lot of this conversation is disingenuous. Uh, a lot of this conversation is dis. I mean, I'm not an economist. I don't want to go there. But as I said, this is, if we, a lot of the conversation is the amount of, the, the kitty that you have, how mm -hmm. much of you, of that are you spending mm -hmm. on economic, social, and cultural rights? Yeah. And this is often a smokescreen, saying that we can't, you know, very well have clean water for everybody in the next two years. Of course you can't, mm -hmm. in, the, in the country uh, the size of Pakistan. But what you can do is allocate a higher percent of your GDP to this. 
And what you can do is have social protection networks. Uh, again, this would, it's a specific conversation. We've seen that work. We've mm -hmm. seen that work with uh, Benazir Income Support Program. Yeah. This has become a global success, right? That you can do, I mean, uh, things that which, where you divert the existing resources. So the, and also, there is a formal legal answer to this. Mm -hmm. The formal legal answer to this is you promised it under Article 25A. Now do it. Mm. I mean, but I'm not giving that answer. But when you make it a right, that is the answer to it. Yeah. Then the answer is not, well, you know, we'll sort of see if you have the money next Tuesday. Mm. You should not. If you've made a promise, as I said, the, the grand norm of uh, social protection, of economic justice, is the state as the duty bearer yep. and the individual as the right holder. This is not generosity, this is not benevolence, this is not somebody being kind, this is not somebody pitying the poor. Uh, because what that does is that makes you throw token money at things, mm -hmm. as opposed to creating a policy. And again, on social protection, there's, there's a lot of work done, I wouldn't want to go there. Uh, but you can have policies, and there are examples from Latin America, there are mm -hmm. examples from East Asia, on housing, on resettlement, yeah. where you can make the best possible policy and allocate the best possible yeah. resources that you can. Thank you. Um, thank you, Suroop. And of course, that was a very <laughs> enlightening answer. Uh, Gabriela, I would like to come to you now because we've been talking about domestic issues. We've been talking about governance structures and we've been talking about the challenges that exist within Pakistan. But we do have the UN system which does hold states accountable to a certain extent, especially when it when we talk about reporting. So under the convention and, and, and under the covenant for economic, cultural and social rights, Pakistan is supposed to report on the, ex on the extent or the progress of uh, the country itself and how much we have been able to do. So can you sort of shed light on the importance of reporting and how that can be leveraged within the protection of economic, social and cultural rights as well? Yes, of course. I mean, I think the most important part about the reporting cycle before the treaty bodies, and in this case particularly on uh, the, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, it's not just an exercise of uh, evaluating the country and, and identifying everything that's going wrong. It really is an opportunity for the state to do an assessment of uh, the, the situation of the état de lieu, as they would say, in Geneva, and then bring that information to the, to the experts of the committee. So to engage in a dialogue with the experts of the committee who have uh, that thematic expertise on these issues and see what are the different avenues that the state can take to improve um, and to have a very successful reporting to, to I mean, the, the, the Pakistan reported to the, this particular committee in 2017, so it's been, it's been a while now. Mm -hmm. I understand the report for the second review before the committee was due during the summer of 2022, but I understand there's been a delay. Uh, but but the, the reporting process itself, preparing the report, is a great way for the state to do an assessment of where it stands with regard to these, uh, these rights, and more specifically with regard to the previous recommendations that they already received from the committee mm -hmm. to improve uh, the implementation of economic, social, and cultural rights. And then the elaboration of these reports uh, to have a more thorough and comprehensive assessment, it should be a participatory process. Mm -hmm. I wonder, for example, if all these very interesting judgments that were presented uh, today have been reflected in any way in the reporting that Pakistan does to the international community. Some of them are very valuable, mm -hmm. uh, where you can see the judiciary taking a stance and really advocating for uh, human rights through the courts. That is something that could be part of this assessment mm -hmm. uh, involving not only the judiciary, involving the, uh, the parliament, involving civil society actors, the national human rights institution. Uh, some states do very thorough and comprehensive consultation processes mm -hmm. to create the report, to bring a report that Geneva that was uh, drafted with all these participants uh, together. But because also these are the same stakeholders that once that committee reviews and brings out new recommendations, will be responsible of uh, putting them in place. So the more comprehensive and carefully the report is drafted, then the recommendations made by the, by the committee will be more, more tailored, uh, more, more useful, and then will give more um, adequate guidance to the state as to how to implement afterwards. Mm -hmm. 
uh, one of the things that has proved quite successful in, in the treaty bodies uh, reporting process, and some countries have implemented it quite successfully, is the creation of uh, national mechanisms to, for follow-up of the recommendations. And not only of the treaty bodies, uh, this particular committee, but also of the UPR. I mean, Pakistan is going through its UPR review early next year, uh, and also of recommendations made by the special procedures. So having these national mechanisms as an institution to periodically review what recommendations are coming in, what have we done, how are we going to report back, with consultation, in consultation with all the relevant stakeholders. That creates an institutional capacity within the, within the state to better engage each time with the international mechanisms, but also to better implement the recommendations and advance in a better way in the realization of, of these rights uh, within, within the country. So again, I refer to all the resources that are available through the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, where you can find uh, guidance, manuals, um, how, for example, to create indicators, indicators that help you measure the progress that you have done on these rights, but not only economic, social, cultural rights. There are indicators on, uh, how, on, on, on the progress on civil and political rights as well, on the role of the judiciary. All these instruments are out there, and it's just a matter of bringing them into the reality of, of the country and trying yeah. to apply them in the way that will be useful for policy making and for the advancement of human rights within the country. Yeah. Of course, thank you so much, Gabriela. Two very important points here that I would like to highlight. Firstly, that reporting really helps you assess where you stand. It really helps you understand this is the progress that we've made and this is what we need to do, especially when you have recommendations by experts on, on these areas. And secondly, the reporting cycle also allows the state to showcase what they have done. So you talked about public interest litigation, um, just as Jawad talked about very important cases that we have had, Shaila Zia versus Vabda, the Masi case, Sana's case, of course. These are very important cases that Pakistan's judiciary has been able to uh, within which Pakistan's judiciary has been able to protect economic, social, and cultural rights. And Dr. Rahim, that brings me to um, a particular question from you as well. Firstly, I would like to ask you what Pakistan and specific steps that Pakistan can take to improve its protection of economic, social and cultural rights and what role can public interest litigation can play within it? Because we've seen that judicial activism has been leveraged. These protections are being placed. So what role can public interest litigation play within this very specific ambit of human rights as well? Honest with you, I'm a big fan of the public interest litigation. There are a lot of controversies about the uh, exercise of judicial activism. I'm not uh, in favor of the exercising judicial activism in the commercial matters. Yeah. Uh, the, those have the international repercussions. Uh, but to the extent of public interest litigation, uh, unless this system uh, properly uh, come, come to in place, uh, judicial activism or the public interest litigation plays a very significant role uh, towards the protection of uh, uh, fundamental right or the social well-being of the citizens of Pakistan. Uh, with regard to the what else can do, uh, I would again refer to some data uh, about the judiciary. Uh, at the moment, uh, no, I think no one knows, every year the judiciary of Pakistan deals with uh, 3.5 to 4 million cases, decides, not deals, mm -hmm. 3.5 million to 4 million cases a year. and. Uh, Altogether, the approved strength of the judges in Pakistan is 3,000. So if we come to the judge to case ratio, that is about 750 to 1,000 cases a year, uh, one judge. And if you come to judge to population ratio, that is around 100,000 person per judge. Uh, because at the moment, we are not working with the full strength. Approximately around 2,000 judges are working and 25% positions are vacant. And this is done, this tremendous job is done by the judiciary of Pakistan with the only 75% strength. Uh, to address uh, for the social well-being, we need to uh, curtail the burden of the courts, uh, especially the pendency which we uh, refer the backlog 2.0. I guess 4 million cases uh, on the courts. We need to improve the legal education system. Uh, please, uh, don't, don't mind if I categorically mention that every year when there are examination of the uh, subordinate judiciary, uh, the success ratio is, I think, not even 1%. What does this reflect? This reflect our education system, legal education system is not up to the marks. So if 
our legal education system is up to the mark, we would have uh, uh, filled these 25% positions. And if uh, judiciary is working with 100% strength, with the full swing, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be any backlog. Uh, get an idea, if 75% uh, judges are dealing with the 3.5 million cases a year, mm -hmm. if they are 100%, then they would be dealing with the 5 million cases. So in one go, 1.5 million cases stays out of the docket of the courts. And then the following year, uh, one more 1 1.5 million cases goes away and there's no backlog with zero backlog. So this reflects we are not properly working in support of our judiciary. And secondly, we need to improve the alternative dispute resolution system in the country. Yeah. Because a lot of the lit litigation which we have examined and we have seen are the egoistic based minor cases that uh, diverse the attention of the honorable courts from the very important issues. When these petty issues are dealt through the ADR, then these uh, the courts and the judges would have plenty of time to deal with the public interest litigation. They would have uh, plenty of time to uh, deal with the important uh, cases involving question of law, question of constitution, and then uh, the, the development of law would lead us towards a very uh, uh, a country having the rule of law embedded in its system. Yep. Thank you so much, Dr. Rahim, and thank you again to my panelists. I know I've taken a lot of time just asking the questions that I was interested in, but I would now open the um, floor for questions. If anyone has any questions, we'll be able to take them now. Uh, there is one over here, and then there is one at the back. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, uh, Sayyid Muhammad Mustafa. I'm honestly just a student in the presence of the esteemed colleagues. Um, thank you to everybody, but I was just having a bit of confusion because I'm still grappling around the idea of rights. Um, we saw that in the Constitution it says that we, let's say, have the right to not be enslaved. I think that's number 11. But when we look at, for example, and Sarup Saab, this might be pertinent to you, but when we look at, for example, law, legislation and liberty, Friedrich Hayek, he talks about social protection and, of course, how when you are taking money from the taxpayer and giving it to another person, you are essentially enslaving them because benefits from one party who have not worked for that are being transferred to another. Now, that is where the question arises, how do we address that, you know, inconsistency in what the two laws are saying? The other part, of course, would be from more of a democratic perspective, that when we look at the notions of justice, again, borrowing on libertarian literature, justice would be fairness. Would it be democratic if individuals are then able to infer and prescribe what a society ought to be prescribing as just in a constitution which reflects the social contract in a particular country. I'm sorry if these are a bit muddled, but um, over to you. Um, okay. Um, I mean, the the first idea of, you know, what is slavery, I think uh, this is the Vaz Hassan Saab also spoke about, you know, this bonded labor. Part of it is because slavery, uh, the idea of slavery, I, that's the kind of the precursor to the modern human rights uh, movement and human rights as they exist at the start of the 20th century, the two big movements before there was, before Universal Declaration of Human Rights, even before there was, the women suffrage movement uh, movement and the anti-slavery movement was what has led to laid the foundation of it. But of course, these are technical terms. Which have, I mean, Pakistani law defines what slavery is uh, in uh, in the multiple legislations. So that's I think a question of what and what is not <coughs> slavery is, is more of a technical question. There is a so bonded labor, for example, for the longest time, mm -hmm. the idea of enslavement and, and bonded labor uh, because they made certain uh, certain requirements to be filled, fulfilled in a relationship for it to be called slavery, right? It comes from the idea of 
uh, being enslaved, being treated as chattel, it's property, uh, being restrained against your will, having no, no uh, right to leave, etc. So that's, that's one part. The second, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, I, so I don't uh, know. Or what, I mean, but because, I mean, as far as the social contract, I mean, again, uh, so I mean, I, I start with the disclaimer that I'm not entirely sure. It speaks more to my uh, comprehension skills. Uh, but uh, again, there is, all of this comes from a social contract, right? Uh, and it, when, and again, uh, I'll refer to uh, Mr. Jawadasan's uh, uh, keynote or speech before the session, when Pakistan does ratify these principles. So some of these principles Pakistan has ratified, uh, has made it into the constitution. Uh, some of them have been in the constitution when it was framed or it was amended. Uh, uh, some of these are now principles of universal principles of human rights. Uh, so, you know, Yuskugan, so norms of civilized notions, uh, nations, etc., etc. So, again, uh, there has been what I'll say very briefly, not sort of, uh, uh, doing a history uh, spiel, is there was, um, because you mentioned the word libertarian literature, uh, it is, as I said, you know, if you look at even the discourse in the United States right now, it is, there is a discourse happening, some of times very robust, between equality of opportunity and material equality, right? Uh, so if everyone, and that's the civil and political rights discourse, if, if, if everyone can apply for a job, uh, that's what the state ensures. The state is, does, does not have to give you a job. Uh, I think that, I don't agree with it, uh, I'll say this, because, and then there is a more technical conversation on, I mean, I can refer you to Samuel Moyan, uh, Sam Moyan has written a book, uh, and I mean, I'll stop there, but he's written a book on I, what I think is the question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we have a question from here. Very fruitful discussion, and uh, particularly the importance of the courts working in their uh, enforcement of the fundamental rights has been a hallmark in our uh, discussion. Uh, I just wanted to ask a very pertinent question that, uh, you know, if the executive fails to perform its function or protect the rights of the people, the court comes into play, the judiciary plays its role. Now, this has been happening with the background of judicial activism. And it, one can feel that now the executive or the legislature are somewhat, they have somewhat become addicted to the court's orders. Is it so? <laughs> if this is so, uh, that reminds me of a very, uh, not very odd, but a very simple example of a child who was, uh, you know, he has got a feeling that he will not fall down, he will jump and run carelessly. Unless he falls down and you know, experiences it, then he, cannot, he will not be able to learn. So my question is that do you think that uh, while pointing out a specific instance of violation of the fundamental rights and enforcement of fundamental right, the court should go a little ahead and point out the measures for self-accountability of the particular branch of the executive so that this instance should not be repeated again. And there has to be a, as we as we just, just talking about it, that, for example, Zafia Bano's case, it was a decision which has to be implemented. Now, who has to implement it? What organs of the states and what specific uh, cells or what specific uh, you know uh, wings of the state have to implement it? They have to come up with their reports, as you pointed out, rightly pointed out. And to show that these steps we have taken, because we have the best of the best laws, and perhaps we have the very good judgments coming, like from uh, Justice Jawad and other good judges of uh, our superior courts. So, don't you think that uh, it is a somewhat uh, some kind of an addiction to the executive that they are unable to work? Doctor Rahim, would you like yeah. to take the question? Yes, my lord, uh, you are very uh, right to point out this. The executive is uh, pretty much addicted. Uh, to the court's direction now. Since I'm working on the executive side uh, nowadays, so I come across this problem nowadays, every day, uh, only those things are implemented which, are, which come from the courts. Uh, with regard to my own authority, uh, there were certain verdicts from the Islamabad High Court directions 
and thereafter entire ministry was running uh, before that I was running behind them now they are running behind me so you are very ri rightly to point out this uh, that they are pretty much addicted with regard to your second part uh, there need to be some uh, uh, directions are pointing out the uh, responsibles I would refer the Honorable Mr. Justice Ali Nuaz Shuhan's working in Rawalpindi High Court at that time I used to uh, practice in the Rawalpindi bench every day when this kind of issue used to come before uh, his lordship not only he used to pass direction in this way but he also uh, used to held responsible to the negligent people and uh, at least in his lordship's bench I never saw uh, the negligent people again I may refer a number of cases of his lordship uh, where he not only passed the judgment on the writ petition but also he held responsible uh, to those who were negligent in performing their obligations, sir. Thank you. Um, we had another question from here. Yes, my lord. Uh, to answer the Gabriela's uh, comment, uh, every uh, international covenant which Pakistan has ratified and incorporated, there is the uh, uh, implementation unit at the ministry like for climate change the ministry is there and there are most of them because they always they need to be a follow-up and how much compliance has been done and most of some judgments which we are also looking into it are also examined by the court that whether after the internet because if you, if you read and I'll ask one of the speakers here all the JPP to give you the uh, judgments of these courts which you mentioned, for you to know that most judgments are one which they want me to, to make the law, and some where laws and all mention international treaty and its, its requirement for Pakistan, its benefit, and then how, why it's not been implemented. The treaty and the law, and that is how we take the, the, the power to enforce them through by linking them with the fundamental rights because there is no straight law to implement the treaty or the law but once you have to link them with the fundamental rights so you have uh, can find any kind of fundamental rights from article 9 to article 14 to article 37 27 for discrimination you can find even a, to protect the child mother and family article 35 says you know, all Constitution has every kind of thing in this constitution. So when linking them together with international law, then you can say the courts can enforce. Thank you. Um, I think at this point now, I would like to thank the panelists for their time and to the audience for their patience. Uh, thank you so much. And it was such an enlightening discussion. And thank you, everyone. It's goes bilaterally. Thank you.